She's Be Podcast. Check it out. The She's Be Audio Experience. Train by day. She's Be Podcast by night. All day. So, Alexander Graves from selfconquering.com. Um, I think we'll start with like, I think the thing I guess you're maybe most famous for is being in Andrew Tate's war room. I know that's your, your, your largest video on your YouTube channel is about your experience there. And I didn't know this, but you said to me uh, that you nearly ended up divorcing your wife because of that. Like, what, what's that story? Yeah, so I think it's been almost two years since I joined the war room. And I was in it for over a year in Andrew Tate's war room. And um, yeah, when you join that, it's sort of you, you get faced into a certain direction, which is pretty much... I mean, he, he says you, you don't need to become a pimp, right, to join there. And they have apparently married guys in there also. But it's very clear from the, the resources you get and what the, what the guys talk about, that this is the direction they send you in. And even if you don't go the, down the pimping route, which I didn't, of course, um, then you will still end up being phased into the direction of using women for pretty much yeah, sex or making money. And that's pretty much it. And it instills this very negative mindset in you that they are really just assets you can use in your life as a man. And this is, and I must admit, I adopted some of that mindset at that time because I thought, because you see these guys winning, right? You see them making millions of dollars and having multiple women and having their relationships. Mm. Place. At least this is what they tell you or show you. Um, and then you think, okay, sure, there must be something to it, right? It's pretty much... A similar thing I gained with the Red Bull, which we will, I guess, talk also about later. And um, like you see that and you think, okay, there must be something about it, right? Something must be true about it. So you, so you apply some of these, these methods. And I realized it now, I didn't realize it back then, but what I really ended up doing was just emotionally manipulate my wife and using control to, to gain what I want from her, which was just obedience, I guess. And this, of course, <laughs> if you have a, I would say, if you have a emotionally healthy woman, then this doesn't work. <laughs> mm. if, if they have some sort of damage and they all experience abuse, I guess, then of course they need the iron fist and the, the strong hand. But uh, my wife absolutely isn't that. So and I don't want this as a woman in my life. So and I did these things. I threatened divorce myself. She talked about divorce because it was at that time like we were really fighting a lot because it was power games all the time, right? I was mm -hmm. trying to gain power over her. She, of course, didn't want this to happen um, because yeah, that's not how you do a relationship. So at some point we were really talking about divorce and this is when, when it sort of lit up in my mind. I was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> I was told when I joined this that I would actually gain all the benefits from the feminine, right? And without any issues. So how am I sitting in the situation where I'm almost divorcing my wife? What, what's going on here? And this is sort of when uh, when I started to um, look a little bit deeper into my actions, into what they are doing. And this is when I discovered that most of it is really, you know, I call it the cult these days, what they're doing. And I discovered it myself. So and this is when they decided to leave. Yeah, sure. So if anyone wants to check out that video, you did a review on the war room. That's, that's on uh, Alex's YouTube channel, which will be linked but for anyone who doesn't know what it is it's, uh, i should have mentioned it's basically this how would you describe it like network andrew tate's network it's like i don't know how like five thousand dollars a year or something now to join um yes. and yeah network with millionaires and all that so um sounds good right but <laughs> uh, apparently not so great according to you yeah um i mean i think that kind of leads pretty well onto the next thing i was going to ask was like how was your kind of view on marriage change? Because I saw in one of your videos you said that you're a big fan of it, but you don't think you can really recommend it to men because they don't fully understand what they're getting themselves into. Yes. Yes, I'm a big fan of marriage, absolutely, um, because it shows you your, your own flaws and your own issues if you are opening your eyes to it. What I mean by this is because it sounds a bit abstract, is you... If you want to have a marriage run with a woman or even for women, I guess it's the same. You will have to go into yourself and understand the lies you tell yourself about who you are, right? 
the other person will show you that because you will, if, for example, if something doesn't work, classic example is sex, right? Uh, most, I think it's actually one of the, I think it's the first reason or the main reason why people get divorced in the US is the lack of intimacy, I think. Money, I think reason, money's up there. Yeah, I, I thought it was the second was money, but maybe, maybe it's maybe. the other way around. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but at least intimacy is up there. So let's just say, let's just say this doesn't work, right? And you, you don't get what you, you don't have your needs met. And you can't just, I mean, the red pill and the Andrew Tate teaches you then you need to withdraw attention, right? And you need to become a great man and high value man, all these kind of things. But the problem really is, in my eyes, and what I discovered is that you are not true to yourself, what you want. Like most guys, they don't even tell their partners what they want, how much they want it and what they actually are seeking. It's not sex in most cases. It's usually connection you want with the other person. So through that, through your wife, you actually see, OK, I'm having issues just talking about my emotions. This was, for example, a big issue for me. Uh, since I didn't grow up with much law from my parents, it was like it wasn't an abusive childhood, but not much emotion, I would say. Um, I always had issues showing my emotions myself to other people, especially my wife in this case. So obviously then, since we always attract what we are, not what we want, right? She was also a person who had issues with that. So this was for us both great to see, okay, I actually have an issue here. And through the marriage, I only noticed that because if I'm in a relationship, no strings attached, right? No marriage, whatever. I can just leave if it doesn't work out. And I've done this extensively in the past, right? When when things didn't work the way I wanted it to, I just I just broke up. And but what this did was I never actually solved the underlying issue, but made it happen in the first place. Mm. So through marriage, you get into a. Of course, you put yourself in a contract you cannot get out easily. But this is a good thing, as good as it sounds, because then you actually have to work for your bullshit. Right? You have to go through it. You can't just leave and mm. keep that, that stuff with you. You have to go through it. Otherwise, you lose contact with your kids or you lose a lot of money through divorce, all these kind of things. So. I know it's sort of using fear to get you there, but it's very powerful in this case. And I like the fear of losing um, your wife and your kids and the money, but it helps you to actually go through these things. So this is what I like about it. And this is what makes it so powerful. But I would say that at least 90% of people out there are in complete denial or afraid of going through these emotions or talking about deep topics with their partner and deep issues they have within their relationship. Because it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy. But this is what actually makes you grow as a person. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I didn't. I haven't really thought about it like that before. It kind of does make you do the work. You can't just keep running off, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned it a couple of times already, like the red pill. Can you kind of quickly explain what that is for people who don't know? Yeah, I mean, um, Red Pill is pretty much a term from, from the Matrix movie, right? From 1999, I think, the first one, where the protagonist is, yeah, exactly, <laughs> is given the choice between the Red Pill and the Blue Pill. And the Blue Pill meaning he stays in the fake reality he was born into, which is all lies. And the Red Pill then is the cold, harsh truth, pretty much. And you've seen this everywhere, pretty much online. Um, being Red Pill doesn't or it means a lot of things, can mean a lot of things, just being into the truth. But there is a movement which is generally called the Red Pill, which revolves around dating and relationships, right? Yeah. And specifically talks about um, how women operate, right? This is what they say, at least. Um, there is one main figure, it's Rollo Tomasi, right? He pretty much coined this, or made it public, I should say. He wasn't the first one, but he made it pretty public with the Rational Male book series which I also read, of course, and um, I considered myself red pill in the past, <laughs> um, which means you, you know these things and believe in that. <clears throat> and one of the main ideas they always talk about, for example, is hypergamy, right? That all women are hypergamous, meaning they always strive to go up the, the social ladder by dating, meaning they need a man or they seek a man that makes more money and is more successful, has more status, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then and um, this is also the result they get from that. So you need to become a high value man. You need to make millions of dollars. Then you get these beautiful women and all these. That's pretty much the logic 
behind the red pill in a nutshell. I mean, they have way more things, but um, this is pretty much what, what, what boils down to in my eyes. Yeah. So how you said you used to describe yourself as that, but how have you kind of like moved past that and what problems did you see with it? Yeah, this was this also sort of came right after the after I left the war room. Um, because at that point, I obviously still was believing, okay, high value and making money out of this is the solution. Um, but then this whole war room thing, this is why I actually like, like the fact that I was in it. It sort of kickstarted this whole revelation for me mm. of this whole sphere and how, how this all is just control and how they are controlling people and pretty much preying on weak men, um, which I was in the past. This is why it worked. And... Then I thought, maybe let's dig a little deeper into, into their, their mindset and their beliefs. So, for example, one thing they always say is, all women are like that. Right? This is the, the, the phrase they have, that all women are hypergamous. And um, there, there's no way around that, <clears throat> which <laughs> is quite funny because not all men are like that. right? So this, then I thought, okay, not all men want the same things. Not all men just want to have... Lambos and mansions. Some of, of them, of course, especially if you're younger, I guess this works a lot. But not everyone is interested in that. And so not all women want the same thing, not even sexually or with dating. And there's even studies behind it. So I did a whole series on my YouTube channel, which was called Science vs. Red Pill, where I talked about these things, that a lot of these truths they put out aren't actually true, backed by science and evolutionary study, right? Um, or many studies that have been taken on that. And we can debate, of course, on studies themselves. Many of them are, of course, fake, I'm sure. But if you if you just look at people with, with a beginner's mind, I would say, and just observing them, you will quickly realize that not all women are the same. They're not all of them seek the, the, the muscular, super strong, super successful guy. Some of them just want to have a, a guy that has his shit together, of course. I mean, I guess that's the baseline. But... That is nice and that it can be a great husband or a great father, right? right? And maybe this is more interesting for them. Or they, some of them might even be more dominant themselves. So they rather want a nice guy. And this could be a connection that works if the masculine feminine energies are aligned. Sure. So this is where when digging really deep into these things. Um, and also another thing they always use is it's just your turn, right? There's another phrase that you are just being used by that woman pretty much and no, there is nothing you can do about it. She will eventually choose a better male than you unless you keep putting in the effort to be the best. And I thought, like, if this is your mindset, <laughs> that it's just your turn and you will be replaced anyway. Um, that's not the life I want to live. And I just decided to not succumb to these beliefs. And then I went digging also, realizing that many of them are wrong. And... This is sort of what kickstarted the whole thing and ended with me. Yeah, uh, how do you phrase this? I don't know. I think the red pill works in a hookup culture, right? Mm -hmm. If you really are only out for sex and you don't want to have any strings attached, no relationship, just out there for sex. I guess, of course, on a basic primal level, a woman would choose a successful, good looking guy if it's just for sex. Sure. But if we're being honest with ourselves, how many times does this actually happen in our life? Unless you're like someone who strives for that, like Andrew Tate, and this is the only thing he does, sure. But for most guys, a random fling or a one-night stand, that doesn't even happen that much, right? And it's not even something you strive for that much if you really get your shit together. So I think this is not really a one-size-fits-all solution, as they, as they put it saying that all women are like that and all of them are hypergamous and all men are the same. It's just a very broad calm stroke over people in general that, of course, doesn't apply to anyone. Hmm. Is there any principles from the red pill that you still believe? I would guess the, the, the one that really comes close to being still true is the burden of performance. This was also coined by, Russian, by the Russian male, Rob Tomasi. And where he just phrased that all men always have the burden of performance. You always need to put in the action, put in the effort to do something with your life, at least get something going. Um, because if you just coast through it most of your life, you don't really 
don't really get something out of it, right? And of course, this also applies to women. Like, even if you're married, right, and your woman, for example, isn't this hypergamous thing as they claim it. She's just a regular, well-raised woman. She still obviously wants a man that has some sort of purpose or that goes somewhere. I guess this is true for anyone because if you just sit at home, um, yeah, watching Netflix and stuffing your your face with Cheerios or whatever, that's of course not very very not a nice sight for her, right? Much like you wouldn't want her to look like that. So I guess so some basic, this really just comes down to basic dignity <laughs> as a human. But he phrased it nicely with this burden of performance because you can you can remember it. So I guess that is true. I would say this is true. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You mentioned uh, the Rational Male book quite a few times. Uh, I heard you also mention in some of your videos that other books was like The Way of the Superior Man and Prometheus Rising. Are there any other books that have had a large impact on you oh yes um i mean the way of the superior man is definitely a i would say a foundational one because in my eyes this really covers the the basis of what it's not i'm not saying should because i don't believe that any man should become something this is for, on his own judgment what he will become or should become right um so reading a book that tells you what you should be is really not very helpful um but this one is really just outlining masculine and feminine energies, right? So this is what I, what I like a lot about it. Um, yeah, Prometheus Rising, also a great one. But when it, comes, when it comes to masculinity, I sort of ditched books after that. I mean, I, as I said, I read all the Rational May books. I read by Jack Donovan. I forgot the name of the book. Um, He's also very famous in the in the masculinity Twitter sphere, but I forgot the name of the book. Um, but it's also uh, this was also one of the initial things that's very much focused on that you should become a certain thing as a man, otherwise you will fail. And this is this is why I ditched most of these books, to be honest. And now only focus on what I believe and think what works for me, mm. and test it in real life. I think this is what men really should do. Yeah. and using the duty intentionally not listening to any guru that telling you what you should become but figuring it out for yourself for example this is why i also only give out tools for you to to work through um like on youtube or wherever i'm not telling you that you should become man a this is what will give you all the results because i've been there I, i've been there I've i've done it and realized it doesn't give me or didn't give me the results i wanted so um yeah i ditched these books completely to be honest I, I don't read any masculinity books or I don't even follow any masculinity um, gurus anymore. And what I do is really only mindset, self-improvement, and um, of course, also the higher realms if you're interested in that. But generally, improvement of life, I guess, life advice, because then you will also find what is important for you. You find the purpose. And this also builds your masculinity in the process, mm -hmm. in my eyes. Yeah. That makes sense, like testing things, not just prescri yeah, I think, prescriptions. Exactly, I think, because I think the big issue we have these days in our society is the term masculinity was not just, it's not just like banned because of the toxic masculinity kind of thing, right? It has been completely distorted. Nobody knows what it actually means, right? If you, if you ask a guy, what do you think masculinity is? Everyone will give you a different answer, which I, in, in theory, it's fine because everyone's different, but nobody knows what it actually means for them. That's, I think, is I think is the key issue. Nobody knows for themselves what masculinity is, and it has been so completely distorted through toxic masculinity, positive masculinity, um, or even um, gender transitions or whatever. So nobody knows what it means. So I think it's just completely and just focus on what you want to become. Mm. So my, my definition, for example, if, of masculinity is, my personal one for me, is to be your complete, true, authentic self. Like if you, for example, you like crying over chick flicks because you're an emotional guy, or you like Star Wars, or, and you like cars, or even you like fighting, that's fine. If that is who you are, then this is what makes you, and you actually stand up for it, then this is what makes you a man, right? Technically, it just makes you a person, but in but in standing up for it and actually following it, this is what your authentic self is in my eyes. For me, maybe um, you or anyone else uh, watching, listening has a different opinion on that, and that's totally fine. Mm. This is what I mean. Different opinions are totally fine. There is not just one correct way of being someone. 
that's in my eyes is, is the key thing most people are afraid of because everyone wants the the easy solution they just want to have a book or a course that gives them step by step and then they get the results but if you do this you're using an external method to solving internal problems mm. you got to go through the emotion label of figuring out all the traumas you have from your childhood or from from your father or your mother and from women that rejected you you need to go through this and then you will discover who you are deep down and this then is what will make you a man or what will make you a proper person in my eyes mm. yeah that's interesting it's making me think like uh, there's this business guru called sam ovens and he talks about how he thinks being yourself is a myth and it's more important instead of who am i it's like who am i becoming because people can change right so yeah if you said you're what was it crying in front of netflix or something like over chick flicks yeah <laughs> yeah if you don't want uh like if you want more from your life then what would you say what would you say about that because some people aren't happy where they are and they want to get somewhere else but yes, should, should yes. they just stay because that's their self now no, 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 absolutely not. There's a big thing. Actually, great thing you mentioned this um, because, because people might misunderstand this. Um, I think you should figure out who you are, absolutely, but this doesn't mean you stay like that, right? Mm. Absolutely not. But the problem is most people don't even know who they are deep down. They have these indoctrinations and layers from peers, what they think they should be, right? Or for, even from their parents, from their childhood. And deep down, they don't even know who they are, who they want to be, even. Maybe they know that they want to be like Andrew Tate. Let's use this example again. Um, they want to have supercars and mansions and multiple models or whatever. But they think that because society ingrained that into them, but deep down, it's actually not them. Mm. Like it was in my case, due to the war room and everything that happened with the red pill. I thought I want to have, I don't know, threesomes and 12 supercars or whatever. I thought this is what I want until I realized I absolutely don't care about these things because I went through the emotional labor of discovering myself, who I am deep down on, on a, like a base level, that I'm just, um, yeah, I, don't, I hate the term nice guy because it's also been very distorted, but I am, I guess, a nice person, I would say, <laughs> deep down, and I don't like control or manipulation of people. Um, so this was the first step, okay? This is pretty much the first step you, you will have to go through. Because only from that standpoint, from that vantage point of seeing yourself pretty much in a third person, you can then decide, okay, what do I actually want from life? Mm -hmm. Regardless of what anyone thinks of it or what society tells me, what teachers tell me, what my parents tell me, what do I want? Because life has so many opportunities, right? So many possibilities of what you can be. But most people just act to the ideas and beliefs they were given from external forces. So I totally agree with, with that guy saying um, you should focus on what you need to become. But I think before you can do this, you first need to know where you are, mm -hmm. who you are right now, and what other people are actually putting into your mind of what you should be. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that part about mental programming is really important. I think I think it's probably the favorite video that you've made. It's, I think it's one of your, your biggest videos. It's about like how the matrix is basically real. And I think I first heard, watched that before I heard about Andrew Tate talking about it. But um, yeah. I think it's true. Like this metaphor that a lot of society is like, how would you say it? Like superficial and yes. and and people get addicted to these things and it's, it's limiting their potential. Uh, I think that links pretty well to like you also talk quite a bit about like the subconscious mind and um, what's it called? So like subliminal messaging. So yes. Yes. how how does that kind of work? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's a big topic for sure. But it's technically technically explained very simply. You have a conscious and a subconscious mind, right? I mean, there also is apparently the collective unconscious. But let's just say we have a conscious mind. That's the one listening right now and interacting with each other, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also a subconscious mind underneath that, that is driven by emotions, beliefs, and picks up everything at all times. Like if you, for example, see something in your peripheral view, your subconscious mind has already picked it up before you like turn your head, right? Mm -hmm. So it sees everything at all times. <clears throat> but the conscious mind filters it out because otherwise we would go crazy if you would constantly yeah. see everything, right? Because when so you- it's sort of a filter, you'd, filter also, you'd also have to like, 
tell your heart to keep beating and stuff, right? Yes, exactly. It also does that. It, it keeps control of all the bodily functions. I mean, you don't have to think about breathing. It does it on its own or how to beat your heart or how to or like the bloodstream moving along. That's all done by the subconscious. And we actually know um, these days that 90 to 95 percent of our daily decisions are driven by the subconscious mind. We're not actually as rational as we might think. And this is because if you think about it, what you do on a daily basis, most of it is sort of automated, right? Hmm. And you, you can test this for yourself when you actually one day you choose a day and consciously decide to do everything the other way around. For example, you get up and you brush your teeth with the other hand that day. Or you don't go first to, to brush your teeth. You first do something else. And do this the whole day and you will also you will actually notice, it's kind of crazy, I did it once. It sort of blew my mind. How much of your day is actually automated? Yeah, habits or subconscious. Yeah, habits, yeah. Habits, exactly, are also part of the subconscious mind. And if you think about it, what you do on a daily basis consistently for years shapes your future, doesn't it? Right? And this then is why subliminal messaging is so powerful because it helps you to reshape your subconscious belief system, solve subconscious traumas, which you have a lot because we live in the age of trauma these days. I actually like this term. Someone coined it. I forgot his name. I think it was Brent Baum who said it. Yeah. He said, we live in the age of trauma because we all grow up with traumas in, in our childhood, right? Some more severe, some less, but definitely happens a lot. And we are indoctrinated and things put in our mind. So with the subconscious, uh, with the subliminal messaging, you can remove a lot of that or reshape it in, into something more positive. Even if it's simple things like just building confidence, right? Because there must be some sort of trauma because maybe you got rejected a lot in the past or your mother never showed you love, for example, in my case, or not much, I should say. And then this sort of created the subconscious belief of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a practical example. Once I first started making 10 grand a month, or the first month I managed that with, with my business, mm -hmm. I subconsciously sabotaged myself. And this happens a lot, subconscious self-sabotage. This is because subconsciously I didn't feel worthy of that success right and then I because this was done with my coaching at that time I completely dropped all the whole coaching thing because I thought I just don't want to do it anymore thinking back if I just would have kept pushing it right I could have then developed this into a course or um, and then put myself out of the coaching whatever it is but it, it wasn't actually a good business decision it was just subconscious self-sabotage and this is why this is so powerful, because as I said, 95% of your daily decisions. So it does shape your future. Most of what you manifest into your life on a daily basis, manifest really just meaning the results of your belief system, is driven by what you thought about yourself or reality years ago. Right? And if you do it consciously, for example, affirmations are there, right? And hmm. even with calls and books, this works also, but it takes forever. Right. I mean, you would need to actually not just read the book, <laughs> which is what most people do, not just read it and then put it on the shelf. You also need to work through it. You take notes, you ponder about it, you meditate on whatever was in there, how you can actually apply this into your life. Right. Okay. Most people don't do this. So the subliminal messaging is a way to bypass that conscious filter and conscious barrier, I would say. So it goes directly into your subconscious mind and then this works much faster and much much stronger going forward yeah so subliminal messaging is that where you have you listen to like audio files with low almost inaudible background uh words right is that right yeah so there are many ways there's also visual subliminal messaging but that's not really a, a thing these days um it's mostly done through audio and what you see, for example, there are free ones on YouTube, but in my eyes, they don't really work. I mean, I tested a bunch of them, and there are many reasons for that. Um, the reason is mostly they just put, for example, what they do is they use affirmations like I am rich, right? Mm -hmm. And this is sped up and overlaid of so many audio tracks that, that you can't consciously understand it, but your subconscious, of course, can't pick it up, right? Because it always understands everything. <clears throat> but the problem is if you listen to that some some other voice telling you that i'm rich your subconscious is just going to be like no i'm not <laughs> just, just look at reality that's not happening <laughs> so this doesn't really do anything if anything it just makes you depressed because you're not there 
So um, some people claim they have results with these kind of subliminals. I never had any of hmm. that um, until I came across one company that does does it differently. What they do is they have they have two two speakers. One of them is a uplifting person, right? They're really just telling you how, how great you are and uplifting you. So that, because hmm. if you are in a positive mood, you are more likely to accept a new new input. And the other one is actually just asking questions. Because from what we know is, subconsciously or through the collective unconscious, we already know everything we need to know. How to make millions of dollars, for example, how to be successful, how to be, how to do relationships. We already know this, but it's blocked through our beliefs, right? So what this does is it asks you, how, why don't you make more money? For example, I don't think this is the actual phrase, but it's just what's coming to my mind. Um, how would you go about solving that relationship issue, whatever? And then your subconscious can figure it out yourself. It's not mm -hmm. something putting it in, in your mind that's forcing you to do things because then it will just deny it. It's actually asking you to come up with the solution yourself. It's pretty much like the Inception movie, if, you, if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, if, uh, you know, the cabrio, I think. The idea is they want to put a, a thought in someone's mind. And for this, they go into their dreams, right? It's the, the movie with the dream levels. Oh, maybe. Yeah, OK. Yeah, exactly. And um, but in, there's a key phrase in the movie where he says the fault has to come from the subject itself, right? External faults will always be denied or they will always recognize that it's not your own fault that it that, that made it happen. And this is why you use these questions. And this is why this works so much better. So what they do, they have um, actually they have water trickling. It's just water. If you listen to it, that trickles in the background. But in that water woven into in that water sound, they have the, the question. So you can't consciously hear it, but the subconscious picks it up through that. It's crazy technology. And I've been running them for years now. It's 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 insane what it does. Yeah. So have you have you made some of those uh, tracks yourself, right? No, no, I didn't do that. Um, because the guys who made it, uh, um, they have like 20 years of science behind their backs um, and study and research on how to do this because obviously just throwing some some questions in an audio track doesn't do it. They know exactly what they're doing. And I, I stay away from that because I don't know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, it's making me, I'm not sure who it was, but there was, I think someone pretty famous uh, in history he used to think of a problem before they went to bed that they were working on and they'd wake up and they said they usually had the answer because their subconscious has been like yes. working on it in the background all night. Yeah. I recently also heard from, from some other self improvement guy who said, um, he, he's been doing this for years that right before bed, he, he writes down in his journal the questions he has about these issues and the next day he knows the answers, yeah. And this is the subconscious at play because at, at night, the conscious mind is obviously turned off, but the subconscious never sleeps. This is why you hear sounds in the background, right, that happening around you even while you sleep. Um, this is exactly the reason. And then it sort of solves that. Yeah, and if you use these, these subs, then you can do this on a regular basis and completely work through and reshape traumas and reframe them into something positive or how to gain wisdom from that, and these kind of things. How can someone start kind of programming their subconscious in a more positive way? Yeah, so um, I would highly recommend using such a sub and I don't wanna, don't wanna plug the company too much. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, because it is not just to sell them, but they have very great products and um, they have beginner ones. They really just work on like I wouldn't go into spirituality at first. Start with confidence, right? Self-confidence and self-love and self-healing and these kind of things. So that I think is the best thing. And they are very affordable at 34 bucks. Oh, 43 bucks. Um, and you just listen to an MP3 file with some tricky water sound. You, you take a journal out. Uh, write down the thoughts that pop up in your mind because this will there will be a lot and they will show you okay they might even bring up traumas from the past you forgot but then you can actually work for them and reframe them and reshape them and this then lets the emotional charge go because the issue is that traumas from the past we know this is sort of like a if something happens that triggers you emotionally your your mind your subconscious mind takes a snapshot like a second before it happened. And this is the image you keep in your mind, right? 
from the past, something that happened. Um, and that image to this day has an influence on you. You are driven by that. For example, there was a woman that could never lose weight, right? She, she tried all the diets and um, all the, the things that just, just never worked. And then she worked with another great, great YouTuber, I forgot his name. I think it was Clark Hagley, um, big guy. And they worked through her subconscious issues. I think this was done through therapy and not exactly subliminals, but still the same, same thing, just more conscious. And they figured out that she had an abusive boyfriend in the past that always made fun of her weight for being too, too slim. So subconsciously, she tried to avoid becoming slim again because then she would be, she would be exposing herself again to that abuse. Right? So whatever she did consciously, her subconscious was just saying, nah, not, not happening. I don't want to feel this again. And this is how powerful that actually is. Right? Even with physical things like your weight that are influenced by this. Or even we know these days also you can also heal medical issues with that. To some degree, of course, like not everything, but um, some things are driven by traumas and the subconscious mind. And this has a physical expression in your body. And if you solve the underlying issue, it goes away. Hmm. Brent Baum is not a great guy. You can check out on YouTube. Um, Baum, B-A-U-M, like a German word for tree. Yeah. Brent Baum. Um, he also has a lot of great, great tools for doing this therapy yourself, this is the more conscious approach on how to reprogram your subconscious mind. So if you don't want to listen to these things, then check out Brent Baum. He's a great, great guy. Yeah. Makes me think of, um, I think it was Jordan Peterson said, like, if old memories still make you cry, write them mm -hmm. down carefully and completely. And I think a lot of people do need to face their like traumas from the past because oh, yeah. the way I've heard it is that what, anytime someone thinks about it, they have like an emotional reaction and they often just try and numb it with some substance or whatever, some pleasure. Um, yeah. But the thing is, like, you, you always have an emotional reaction. Your brain doesn't really properly understand what happened. So you kind of have to go back and figure out, like, what actually happened. And then you can kind of begin to accept it more. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the thing. This is also, by the way, how addictions, or many addictions, not all of them, but many of them actually come into place. Because there was some point in your past where you avoided going through the emotional labor, but instead you went to some sort of dopamine rush, pleasure kind of thing. Could be anything from smoking to porn or even sex itself. Money is also can also be an addiction or spending money. Hmm. So um, if you want to get rid of, of an addiction, you also need to go in, figure out in yourself what actually caused in the first place. The first time you did it, what was the reason what happened there, it could also be a day before that. Maybe you were rejected sexually, I don't know, and the next day you went to porn and now it became an addiction, for yeah. example. Loneliness and, is another one. Sorry? Loneliness is another oh, yeah. common one. Yeah, that's also a big one. Yeah, exactly. Loneliness. So, and you only solve that by actually going through that emotional labor and working through these emotions. Now that you're years later on adult, you can just say, okay, this happened in the past. It was bad for whatever reason it happened but it, it didn't kill us, it's fine, we can let it go. And you sort of get into, into a dialogue with yourself, mm. right? I know this sounds weird for many people, but this is what you do. And then the addiction becomes less and less. Brent Baum, I think also was it who actually cured someone of his, um, of his smoking addiction in that very scene, in that very clip, and he didn't even want to touch the pack of cigarettes in his, in his jacket anymore. He was just it was just disgusted by it completely so it's really just the the emotion that sometimes drives you there wow yeah yeah i think people just underestimate how powerful the emotions and their subconscious mind actually is because nobody knows nobody tells you right how, how could you know everyone thinks it's just the physical and the conscious mind and rationality and what you see this is what is there but there's so much more going yeah. on in the mind and that's the problem with people putting in all sorts of junk into their brain. Like, yeah. you hear people talk about information diet. If you're consuming, like, stuff that's, I guess, fearful or just negative, then that's, yeah. go that's going in. That's doing stuff in there. Another big thing also for people when they, like, fall asleep in front of, the, in front of Netflix or whatever, right? Because while you're sleeping, your subconscious mind, like, the conscious fit is obviously out and the conscious mind picks it up. So whatever comes on in your Netflix, if you're watching a horror show or whatever, mm. and you fall asleep or watch some sort of 
violent movie. And this is what goes into your subconscious mind. So people got to be very careful with what they put in their mind. And I've, <laughs> I've done this for the longest time, obviously, because I didn't know better. But these days, uh, I don't watch the news ever. I'm, I'm very careful of what shows I watch with my wife. I'm, I'm like very picky. She's sometimes very annoyed by it. <laughs> when I say, nah, that, that's a bit too negative. I don't want to watch it. And these kind of things. But same with music, by the way, right? Music is another yes. great one. Because if you listen to music, you sort of get in this, this trance state, right? This is why you get sometimes goosebumps when you really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But the lyrics are often I am or I do or I did this, right? So it's virtually like an affirmation you put into your subconscious mind while being in a trance state. And the, so people have to be very careful with music. The topics of music are these days are exactly. often pretty terrible. Uh, have you heard yeah. of Akira the Don? No, I didn't. No, uh, he kind of makes music out of i guess it's motivational speeches like people like jordan peterson david goggins right, yeah. Yeah. yeah um i think that's good it's kind of like the opposite uh yeah instead of the negative music it's, it's positive right yeah, yeah um, that's a good way of doing it yeah i like this no, that's just i remember him yeah mm -hmm. yeah um this is a bit of a jump but sure. what, what are your thoughts on semen retention and sexual transmutation. Do you think there's anything there? Yes, uh, that's also a big topic, of course. Um, semen retention, I'm a big fan of. It's a great thing because that is very, very powerful. Your, your seminal fluid, right, that contains, I mean, it's basically your best blood cells in there, you, you're spilling. But <laughs> don't, don't shoot so quickly, I would say. Don't be so quickly with it because the problem is if you don't know how to redirect these energies, mm. right? then what's going to happen is that it's just pretty much clogged up down there and it's going to make you even more needy and like weird and restlessness, uh, restless, right? So I think this is what I've discovered and also talked to other guys about it. Sure, go down the road, the route of semen retention at some point, but don't try to do it from masturbating to porn daily to completely not shooting your load in months, right? Because that's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be very bad. You, your body's just not used to it and your mind isn't either. So you got to figure out, you got to accept that most things that are valuable just take time to develop. That's true for everything. Your business, your relationship, or your self-confidence, your, your self-improvement, everything takes time. And with semen retention, if you're used to getting it out every time, then it will take time to actually rewire that in your brain. But here's something that can help you with this. We actually know these days that orgasm and uh, the release of your semen is actually two different nerves in the, in the human and the male mind, so to speak, right? So you can actually detach them from each other. You don't have to shoot it. You can still have your fun with it. But it takes practice. And especially in the beginning, this is why I say sometimes if you, if you practice your semen retention and you start out with it, give yourself a day where you'll still let go, right? Because then you, you will quickly notice yourself how the energies are actually moving in your body and how they are clogged up down there if you don't know how to move them around, right? And this is a practice you will learn over time. But um, And if you want to go really deep into this, pun intended, I guess, is that you can also do this while having sex, right? Um, which is pretty much, I think, the, the sort of the holy grail of doing it. And I know from a guy, a um, former coach of mine, he, um, he, he said he hasn't actually released in like years. So it's not like your, your ball expl balls explode or something, like all these false beliefs that are out there. Nothing like that. You don't have to get that out. Not at all. It's really, you can only do it to reproduce, for example, and otherwise never shoot it ever, right? It's totally possible. And it doesn't have any, there are also no health benefits to, um, to ejaculation as it is propagated by society. Um, absolutely not. <laughs> this is only true for, I actually checked the science on this because they said it reduces prostate cancer, right? Not studying. That's yeah. not true. It's only true if you are 50 years old or older, then it has a 30% chance of decreasing it like 3% chance of decreasing your chance of getting prostate cancer, but like a chance of a chance when you're 50 years old, that's just irrelevant for most people, right? So um, it's, it's absolutely not 
not sure yet. A bit dangerous, I think. Some of these uh, media outlets latch onto oh, a yeah. scientific study, and I don't even think the people writing the article understand what the study says. You have these crazy headlines, and then you look at it, and it's just like, that's that's not what it says. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that's the problem. Um, this also came from social media in my eyes, where you just can retweet or share with one click without actually reading the article, right? So you just see the headline, and you feel, oh, damn, that's crazy, and then you share it. And people get trained to do this. But actually doing the research on these things yourself and figuring, figuring things out yourself is so vital, so important, because then you don't fall into these traps by society, which are set up completely. I mean, I know this is, people sometimes look at me weird when they say this, but in my eyes, especially for men these days, and women have their own problems, but especially for men these days, society is completely set up against your success, right? It's pretty much designed to groom you to become a worker drone, pretty much, and numb yourself all the time and just, just give your energy to the corporate world. And not even talking about only business here, but also all the other things like um, porn, for example, and uh, yeah, releasing all the time. Because, as you say, these people who make these articles, I'm not sure if they even understand what they say or if they just don't care, right? Because they they, they have obviously a self-interest because they have to write articles to make money. This is their job. Um, this is also the issue why any sort of media outlet that is designed to make money can never be objective because it has to get people to read it or to watch it. So this is kind of a mistake. But um, yeah, this is also why I completely refrain from any, any media. Anything that someone tells me or I come across, I research myself first before I do it. And you see, research sounds so, so tedious, but it just takes five minutes um, to go online, actually find a study, read through it yourself, right? <laughs> um, instead of just believing what is said on, on that article, and, and then you're fine. How do people go around about redirecting the energy that you say is like trapped? Because I don't know if it was you, someone said about imagining the energy almost going up your spine, like to your brain. Yes. That was yeah, you. This is, so um, what this needs mostly is, first of all, the, the groundwork you need to do first is to believe that, the, that you have an energy body and a physical body, right? Which is within yourself. And most people have an issue with that. So this is the first thing you got to research and figure out how this, how this works uh, if you want to go down that route. And then because if you understand this, that this is a thing, that this exists, then you can understand, okay, I can actually control the energies in my body with my mind. And this takes practice, but it's mostly just done by using the mind itself, thinking the direction you want it to be. So let's say the energy comes up, sexual energy, but you want to redirect it into creative energy, which is interesting, but I get into this in a second. Then you just think about, okay, I now have this urge, but why not use this for writing down 500 words right now, right? For example. And then you just use the, your mind and say, with a, with a sort of commanding energy, right? That you have to control over it. And then you, in your mind, say, I'm going to use a different way now to use that energy. And one thing that helps a lot with this is to understand that sexual energy doesn't start as sexual energy, right? Energy that comes up in your body or is redirected is you're just used to making it sexual. For example, we know very well that the, the female breasts, for example, aren't actually a sexual thing by nature. It's just done by our society, right? You know of tribes where the women walk around topless all the time and the, the guys don't walk around with bones, right? <laughs> That is in our society a thing that they are sexualized. So when you see that, you are trained in your mind to automatically turn this sort of energy into sexual energy. It's an automatic habit or has become a habit over time. But if this is possible, you can also redirect it into another energy. Mm -hmm. you just have to do it consciously. But it's the same thing. You're just changing what the energy is used for, right? And you do this with a commanding tone in your mind virtually telling, talking to yourself, dialoguing with yourself, I'm not going to use this somewhere else, redirect it and feel it. A lot of it is feeling. You got to feel yourself better, right? And understand your, yourself better and feel your body, feel your 
energies. But you, you can practice this over time, and the best thing is to to start with also the physical, which means detoxing yourself from all the the trash that is in food and um, in the media and in, I don't know, deodorants, the aluminium, all these kind of things that all block mm -hmm. your receptors. Um, detoxing of all this is pretty much the first step to get the physical healthy and in place, and then you can proceed from there. Would you put fluoride in there as well? Oh, yeah, fluoride, also a big one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Toothpaste, right? For example, or oh, it's it's also in the tap water, right? In the US, I think. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and the UK, I think. Yeah. UK also. Okay, crazy. Um, yeah. So that's definitely something you're gonna get rid of. Fluoride is a big one that pretty much blocks all the sort of, let's say, the higher realms, right? The spiritual paths of your pineal gland, these kind of things, um, which is obviously necessary to get in better contact with your energy body. So. Um, yeah, you do this through the, the physical first, detoxing that. And it's also, of course, healthier, right? You live a better life if you do this. You have more energy on a daily basis, energy again, right? Um, you, woke up, you wake up more energetic, have energy throughout the day. It's like success in all realms. Yeah. I know a lot of guys uh, on like NoFap um, talk about if they get urges, they like do like push-ups until failure or like do a cold shower mm -hmm. or something and i feel like that's a similar redirecting of the energy exactly yeah that's that's also a big thing yeah the nofap community does this a lot they have the right idea absolutely and they just gotta tell people to not go into this cold turkey i think because this in my eyes my personal opinion is difficult if you don't know how to use that energy but at least sending them then into working out is a great idea because then yeah you get the energy out mm. and people also I've heard say that uh, people who try to go cold turkey, they then often have other issues because they have like, they have bad self esteem. They're like, why can't I keep this promise to myself? I keep failing and I keep saying I'm going to cut, cut it off, but I'm not. Yes, this is a great thing you mentioned there because if you do this, you will eventually relapse, right? Um, and because nobody has super willpower all the time right there will be a day where, where shit was hitting the fan all day and then you come home and you're just annoyed and then you see something on some commercial or whatever and then you're ready to open uh, the website again for example um and then you relapse and then you actually hate yourself for that right and this is a downward spiral because then you have this negative self-talk about yourself you're just a loser you can't do it you see all these guys online who do it with body issue they have 360 days streaks or whatever on, on no or whatever it is um this is very bad this is very very bad in my eyes um, this is why i also said that these no fab streaks are in my eyes pretty bad because of course you want to have a goal to get rid of that but if you put yourself down if you fail once for example that just makes it worse. Hmm. Obviously, there's a difference between using it as an excuse to do it again, <laughs> right? And um, putting yourself down. But this is, again, where we come back to the same thing that you have to go into a dialogue with yourself. You relapsed that day. Why did you do it? What happened? What was the reason? What happened that day that made you seek that dopamine you get from the, the orgasm, right? There must have been a reason. And the more you get into a dialogue with yourself, you can figure out what is driving you subconsciously, right? Then you can solve that. But if instead you de deny this completely, you just call yourself a loser because you didn't manage it, that just gets into this, this bad spiral because then you feel bad about yourself, which actually, if anything, just makes you want to do it again more because you want to feel good about yourself. You wouldn't get the dopamine rush. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of that, to be honest. These, these nofab streaks, I think, are... Especially for starters, very dangerous. Mm, it's like Muhammad Ali says, stop counting the days and make the days count. Um, yes. I know yes. a lot of people, I think a big problem they have with it when they're trying to do it is they they build their identity around not doing something. And yeah. what I say to people who are trying to do it is like, you need to have something else. Like, yes. you, you, you should, what, who are you? Oh, I just don't do this habit. It's like, that's not really... Like you, you want something else to be working your energy on and then you don't do this because that's going to mess you up here and you're too busy focused on this thing that's going to be better for you. So it's the same with when people are trying to like quit, I don't know, watching YouTube all day. It's like you can't just not watch YouTube all day and do nothing. Like you need to yeah. have what's the, what's the North Star? Like what are you aiming for? 
Yeah, people forget that the reason they have this addiction, whatever it is, YouTube or no fab, or fapping or whatever, um, is because at that point they try to fill a void, right? But if they just remove the thing, then they're left with the void. So there got to be something else they do instead. It's very great you, you said this. You, you got to have something you actually want to do instead of that. So, um, yeah, it's not just enough to, to remove that. You got to replace it with something else. This is also why I, or someone said you cannot actually delete a habit. You can just alter it. Right, change it into something. Meaning, if for example, you have the the habit of fapping and and porn, then just removing it doesn't really do anything, especially long term, as you said. You got to replace it with something or alter it into that the trigger gets you to do something else. If initially you came home and the first thing was masturbating to porn, now the new thing should be you I don't know work out or you write an article for the blog or whatever it is. Then you're re replacing a bad habit. With a better one, but you have something to, to fill that void with something that actually does anything. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I know in your YouTube description you say, I live in Germany still, in brackets. <laughs> do, do you plan on like leaving Germany? Do you, do you not like it there? Um, no, I don't like it. <laughs> no, that's a bit, a bit pushing it. Um, I mean, it is for, for Western world, obviously, very, very easy to live here, right? So um, I'm not complaining. I know many people have it much, much worse. But I'm like, I look out of the window, it's actually snowing and I hate that, right? <laughs> I'm not a snow guy and we have uh, snow actually a lot down here. So I mean, not as bad as Canada, for example, but I'm planning on leaving at some point or at least having a, a second sort of uh, holiday vacation where I can be at uh, in the winters because I just, I'm, I'm a sun guy. I don't like cold and snow. I just don't like it. It ruins my, my mood. Mm. And um, there are many other things, but that's a, a whole other rabbit hole to go down of why I want to leave some of the Western, why I wouldn't want to go in some of the Western countries, um, especially also leave Germany for, for many reason, reasons, but that's a very, very deep topic. Let's just say I just like the sun more. Sure. We, we can uh, <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you wrote. Uh, what, was, what was I gonna say? No, okay, we'll, we'll go. We'll go to this. Yeah, sure. I saw you wrote a blog post saying, "Well, is Andrew Tate the third Antichrist?" <laughs> I saw that, and I was like, "That's quite the statement." Good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> was that a bit clickbaity, do you think? Or what's what's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, it was, it was of course. It was initially an email I wrote to my, my list and then put it into a blog post that is, of course, a little bit of a, a uh, email opener headline, of course. Um, but it's not just clickbait. It is um, because I think, I truly think, now, everything I have discovered about him, I don't want to go too deep into conspiracy, but let's just say they do some weird rituals there. Um, and there is some some, cult, some actual cult behind that. Um, but the point is, even if we remove all of this, what he does is he's preying on weak men, right? Weak men that don't get what they want is all the guys that come to him. Then he takes the money, but he doesn't actually solve the issues. Right, because what he does is he makes them angry. This is he actually says this, right? So you would think. I know if you know of the map of consciousness. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it, but you like the vibrational scale, kind of with the oh, emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By um, Richard Dawkins, I think was it Richard? That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and one of the lowest ones is of course desire, right, and guilt and shame, and above that, a little bit above that, is anger. Mm. And people say, yeah, you see, um, most guys, they just go through life, they hate their lives, and then they find Andrew Tate, now they're angry and want to change things. This sounds good on the surface, <laughs> but it isn't, because what it actually ends up with is guys that are angry at women, themselves, society, virtually everyone, they hate everyone, they are resentful still because they didn't solve the issues, and they are still then end up being angry at everyone. And that just makes everyone angry. <laughs> that doesn't really solve an issue. Um, or to solve the issue of people that they would understand that they need to solve their issues deep down, which they have, without anger. 
they just got to figure out the problems, the traumas and the, the wrong beliefs. But you don't need anger for that. So and this is why I came around with the, with the Antichrist, Antichrist idea, because he actually has now a, a huge mob. He has a lot of followers, right? A lot of, I call them sellouts because I was one of them who religiously just spot out what he says. And this way they are angry people who control and manipulate other people and thus make society worse than it was before. Now, in no case was it good for men to be in a desire-ridden, apathetic state. Of course not. But I don't, I'm not sure that anger is better. I'm just not sure that that makes anything better. At least they don't fight people that way, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and I had people come to me. There was one guy who said he almost actually killed himself after he come, came across all the, the Andrew Tate teachings and applied some of them, realized it doesn't work, just made him, made him, him hate himself, right? Because one of the, the basic ideas of Andrew Tate is the villain theory, right? That you have a, a villain that is yourself, that is always better than you. He always succeeds over you, whatever it is. And this sort of gives him drive to do things on a daily basis, right? Mm. The problem is this, what this all does is it makes you always inferior. You're always worse <laughs> than, than the other being, right? You, you never win. Regardless of what you do, the villain is always better. So you will, you will never win. What kind of a life is that, right? So I get the basic idea of it that it gives you drive to do things. But if you never succeed against that person, that's obviously very bad. And this is very much different from what John Peterson, for example, says. Was it John Peterson who said that you need to be 1% better or better, better than yourself yesterday? I don't know who, who it was. It's quite a few people. James Clear, yeah, maybe. Was. The guy who wrote Atomic yeah. Habits. I don't know. It's quite a few. Yeah, exactly. So, and the difference here is that you are not fighting yourself. You're trying to be better. Whereas with the will, and you actually are constantly fighting yourself, the, the part of yourself that is better, right? So it's a fight again, rooted in anger. And it's these minute details, right? These little details that make a big difference in how people come out of that. And again, um, I have never seen a self-improvement guru that had a guy who wanted to kill himself because of his teachings. And this is what happened to me. Some, some guy came to me, who told me this, and he was very um, grateful to find my war room review where I talked about this. And this sort of gave him, gave him hope again. I, I was devastated when I, when I heard about this, I was like, how, how could this happen? This is actually the, the reason this guy came to me was when I decided to write this, this email and this blog post. Because I, I pondered on it a little bit and realized that this is what he does. He actually makes people angry and does make society worse in the process, in my eyes at least. Do you not think he helps anyone though? Because like, I have heard people say that he's like inspired them to start going to the gym and trying to gain more freedom in their life, so... Do you think there's no benefit from what he says? I think what he, for example, he has also great t teachings about making money and business, right? And I think if he would have stuck with just that, that's been fine. Hmm. Um, but then again, he probably wouldn't have, have risen to the stardom um, because the controversy is, of course, what made him successful. But for, for the people following him, the problem is that the money lessons and the business lessons, they come with this, this side dish of all the, the negative stuff he brings up. Like you come across it regardless, right? Um, and this is, I think, where it... I won't say that it doesn't help anyone, right? Of course, some people gain some from it and some have the insight to just take what works for them and discard the rest. If they can do it, that's fine, but not everyone can. And I'm sure many of his followers can't. So I think that... No, I'm going to say, I think for most people that follow him, it's making their life worse. They might get external results, money, for example, or maybe even they, they lay some, some models or whatever, but they never solve the issues they have within themselves. So five years, 10 years down the line, especially later in life, they will realize they only focus on external means to solve the internal problems. And then notice it doesn't actually solve those problems. They still have these traumas and issues within them that are still driving them, even though they get external dopamine resolves from that. So um, a great metaphor, I think, is if you don't get sex from your woman, Andrew Tate is pretty much like watching porn. 
it's an external thing, external solution that doesn't actually solve your internal problems for you to get the real deal. For example, if you don't get the sex life you want from your from your partner, you, you will have to go through issues. You will have to work out why why it's happening. There must be something with you, with her, maybe she also has issues, of course, but you gotta go through that emotional labor, right? We talked about this initially. And with Andrew Tate and what he teaches, um, this is like getting an external fix for that and not actually solving the problem underneath. So yes, externally, it looks like some things work, but I think for most people, um, it doesn't. Mm, yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, what was I going to say? Some people... Uh, yeah, I think it was... I think it's, it does seem... He does seem quite... Well, I guess he is... He does seem more spiritual now than he used to be, but I think you did say you thought he was, I guess, insecure. And just just for the record, you haven't like, you haven't met him, have you? You've. Yes, I actually haven't met him in person, and people have told me this also. But um, the key thing is, he might be a super nice guy in person, right? I don't know, could be, a super super great guy. But um, the only thing that counts is what he puts out online, because this is what people follow, in my eyes. Um, Unless he's not true to himself, or he is true to himself, maybe this is him, I don't know, maybe he isn't. But I think personally, because he also, he mentioned it, I, I do think, I think I also read it, I said it in that blog post, I think he's very insecure. <laughs> People look at me weird when I say this, if you look at him, it doesn't look like it, right? Um, but if you look at how he operates, he's very paranoid on losing all his money, losing all his status, losing all these women, because this is the only thing he bases his, his self worth on, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you look what he does online. If you were to lose it, he says he can build it back quickly, but why is this necessary? Isn't he someone without all these things? Right? And um, this sometimes strikes me a bit weird when I see these things. I mean, I don't follow him anymore. Maybe it changed. But um, back in the days, it was very much just driven by all these external things to, to make him someone. Right? Yeah, I'd be interested to see... Um what happens uh well he's currently locked up or whatever but if he comes out because he recently converted to islam so i'm not i'm not too sure on all the rules there but i i don't know if uh having like all that stuff is that i guess accepted i don't know um i don't think because what is he cigars and whiskey and yeah, yeah. multiple women i don't know I'm pretty sure they. Do. I'm pretty sure Muslims aren't massive fans of alcohol. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure also. Um, yeah, I think I like. I mean, maybe I'm biased, right? But I think this is just another um, publicity tool. I don't really believe that he is actually or has actually converted to Islam. In my eyes, it just works well because um, obviously online you, you become controversial. You see, if you want to be successful and you don't care about morals, the easiest thing is to just put yourself in the group and everyone else outside of that group is a loser. Right, that's pretty much what he does. Groupthink is what we work with these days everywhere. This is what society is pretty much built on. But this always divides people, right? Always. You're either in the group or not. And if you're not in it, then you kind of want to get in there. And if you're in the group, everyone outside of it is just a loser because he doesn't know what you know, right? And I don't mean religion here, right? I just mean general belief groups or whatever. And if you do this, he, he just joined that religion because it is as a group, pretty much, then he can sort of use it because he said once, I remember this, that this is the, the last masculine religion because you can't have multiple women, this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, it does fit his idea of what the masculine man is, right? Um, but it's just, it triggers some, some Christians that followed him before, I guess. It triggers some Muslims because of what he does um, with the alcohol, for example, as you say. And so it triggers emotions and group think and this is what makes you what gives you publicity right what helps you to, to rise higher on the ranks if you want that yeah no i wasn't saying that he was like annoying muslims with like alcohol and stuff i'm just because mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if he was how long he was in the public scene before he got locked up mm -hmm. like i'll be interested to see if his behavior is any different since converting um since he lost know. again radar right huh <laughs> 
since he lost his fight against Greater, right? Wow. Greater Thunder. Oh yeah, I, mm, that was um. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know. Everyone jumped on that. I was like, oh my god, that was so funny. It's just like, hmm, don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. As I said, I have a completely different belief about this these days. So I think this was just another publicity action. Um, but yeah, this is again another deep rabbit hole. <laughs> but yeah, I think to, to answer your question, I don't think he actually converted to Islam. But that's my opinion. And maybe I'm biased, and I might be completely wrong. I think it's just a publicity stunt. Okay. Um, how I know you said before you kind of think you wanted uh, these supercars and mansions or whatever. Um, well, maybe not all that, but that kind of thought. So, but now you seem to be kind of, I guess, more spiritual, less materialistic. Um, what are your thoughts on God, whatever that means to you? Yeah, so that was a big topic uh, for me because I was raised strictly Catholic, right? And now um, I don't, I have a completely different viewpoint on Christianity these days, um, what it is. I think personally, most religions, but especially, no, I cannot say most religions. I should say Christianity, if you look at how it came to be, was mostly designed for control back in the days. Um, you, you notice just if you look at the texts that are hidden to this day, because these actually contain the power of the individual. And this is how I get out of got out of this whole thing because I realized for me at least that this mostly is to control people. Now it does give people hope, right? So I'm not saying that you should completely drop your your beliefs or whatever. And who am I to judge that, right? It's just my personal belief for anyone listening. Um, that's just what happened to me. I came across this, these texts, and um, they talk a lot about how you, pretty much the subconscious mind manifestation, how you actually change your reality to your beliefs um, and how this all works. Obviously, back in the days, they didn't want the general public to have this knowledge, right? <clears throat> so, so these are, that's in, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, so there's, you're saying there's hidden scripts hidden parts of the, yes. bi the bible yes in the bible yeah it's actually not hidden anymore these days i mean the vatican apparently still has some texts they don't release but this, one of them i came across for example if anyone wants to check it out clark Hagley, right he has a big youtube channel i think he has a million subscribers or something like that and one of his most popular videos is about um, the hidden texts of jesus something like that and in there he pretty much talks about how manifestation works right and how you manifest things into reality by your beliefs and how you you set this up just like this is what they properly legit like how how did this come out that there were hidden texts like how, how does he did they release oh, it i remember uh, it's been a while but uh, they're not hidden anymore they were released by the Vatican. many hundred years ago i think but um okay i don't know i'm just a bit i'll, I'll have a look into it but i don't know i feel like it could be something that, you know, someone kind of made and then released and said, hidden, you know, you know. Yeah, no, no, but um, of course, it could just be some YouTube guy or um, some other guy who just made these things and released them. But uh, apparently they are legit. If you do the research on them, um, there is a lot of talk about them or was back, back in the days. Not so much anymore. But yeah, this was pretty much the, the reason for me to dig a little bit deeper again, doing my own research instead of just believing blindly what people are t telling me. And then I, I personally, now this might, because you asked what, what my thought on God is or on spiritual thing. Um, how do I phrase this? I don't believe that there is a external savior ever coming for us. Mm. Uh, yes. I don't think this is ever going to happen because this in my eyes is just another tool for people to hunt something externally instead of solving the issues internally you have all the power you need within yourself everyone has this right everything you need is already within you um, so for me spirituality is more going within myself and discovering the power within me right and i'm not saying power to control but just power i have over my life right over my reality pretty much um, there are other rabbit holes you can go down on how this all operates, uh, the religions. 
some of them if you want to do this but uh, for me this helped me just to to be more at peace with things because i realized okay everything that is in my life good or bad is because of me there's no external force doing this to me good or bad right this is what i do what i believe how i operate in my daily life and uh, this is also not nihilism because i think nihilism is a, is a loser belief sorry for anyone who believes in nihilism i think this is a big mistake um thinking that nothing matters and everything is just going to die anyway and it's all pointless existence is pointless i don't think so um because it's also a very bad mindset in my eyes if you believe that um, because then what do you do with your life i think if it's pointless yeah I, I see what you mean but i think some people do draw meaning from that like it's pointless as in it's a good thing so i can do what i want i can take these risks why not live what i want because like well this is it you know i, I think yeah, that's but, where people come from it uh, come yeah from. okay I, I see that i see that absolutely that makes sense but i don't know if this is maybe i have a wrong understanding of nihilism then but for me this isn't really nihil nihilism this is just really believe in your self-existence but maybe nihilism is the term for that um for me nihilists always seem a little bit like they just don't care because nothing matters so they just coast along um maybe i'm wrong right so um i'm, I'm ready to be judged and corrected for that <laughs> totally fine so yeah but for me again it's just um i don't know if there is a life after death even though i have read many books and made also videos about that that apparently claim there is i personally do believe in reincarnation um but i don't know if there is and i cannot know right but this doesn't mean that i just don't care what i do right now it gives me this initiative and this this drive to understand everything i do is coming from within so I got to be careful of that. I got to make sure everything is set up properly. My body, my mind, my energy body, right? The emotions, because then I will create a better life. And if I create a better life for me, I also create a better life for other people, right? So this is the sort of driving force spiritually for me there. Mm. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that, that I don't think there is someone going coming to save you. And then some people do believe in God and say that, God kind of gives them things and it's not like they I don't know I feel like it depends it depends how it is some people approach it like this they are asking God for things please give me this whereas some people kind yeah. of use that to empower them to do things so I think that that's the better way probably that well I don't know what's better yeah, I mean, people believe what they want but like I think yeah yeah you need the I think like taking ownership is like super important um but I think the better way I had someone describe God was like, it's not a person, it's like an energy kind of, which I think mm. that to me made a lot more sense. Yeah, um, I've read books about this topic um, and for the longest time, I believed completely in that. Maybe I still do to some degree. And what they said is that we are all, like every one of us has a soul, right? And that was once broken off pretty much from god which was just energy right and we are now on planet earth or any other planet and working through through experiences gaining knowledge and experience and this is why we come back over and over again to 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 live as a woman to live as a man to live in poverty to live rich to to feel these things and understand them and once we have everything like that internalized and came out positive then we sort of got uh, like get back to source which is then God, mm. right? So God really, again, isn't there for these people. And I'm just phrasing what the book said, right? Um, is a just energy, light energy, so to speak. And um, this is what you are. This is pretty much what they, what Jesus meant when he said the kingdom is within, right? <clears throat> this is the idea behind that. Um, or the kingdom lies within, I think was the, was the correct quote. So, um, yeah, this might be true. But the problem is, and this is, in my eyes, the big problem with the whole New Age movement, right? Um, and I call it toxic positivity. <laughs> um, because they just think they just got to be positive, and then they will raise their vibe and raise along the, the planes, the physical and spiritual planes, and if they are being positive and don't indulge in negative things. And then they will uh, sort of rise faster on the on these planes to, to come back to source, to God or whatever. Um, but the problem is, 
on the physical plane, you also have negative things you need to work with. Be it, for example, your own bad emotions from the past or if some bad things happen in your life. And just throwing positivity into this doesn't work. Simple example, if you have a relationship, right? You want to make it work. Sometimes you need to stand up for your boundaries, mm -hmm. right? You, you got to make them firm. This could be a very negative, maybe even anger-filled fight because the other person constantly keeps breaching your boundaries. But you, you, you got to have to go into these negative emotions. You can't just say, oh, this person just doesn't know better and um, I don't care because then you will be abused, right? So um, I think this is a very, very bad mindset because it might make you, actually makes you easy to be walked over, right? By other people if you do this. So you got to be careful with just being positive all the time. Sometimes it's totally fine to go into sadness or even anger, sometimes, right? Not all the time, um, to, to work through these emotions, to let, them, to let them go and understand where it's coming from. Right. So this is where I think the toxic positivity, I'm not the only one who talks about this. New Age has this issue that they are, not all of them, right? But some of these, these gurus, I guess, have the issue that they just teach people to be positive at all times, cakes and unicorns, everything is great. Um, but this is not a, a sustainable way to live life on this physical plane if you believe there are more than that. Yeah, I know you made a video called outgrowing jordan peterson but i'm gonna quote him again um yeah <laughs> uh he says yeah, like fine. i'm not saying he's bad right <laughs> yeah yeah um that you should be a monster and then like learn how to control it how it's better to be nice like 99 percent of the time or like 99.5 percent and then mean or then like strict like one percent of the time because that that will actually lead to better life for you um and the people around you usually because yes who is it i think it's machiavelli says like a man is who is loved people fear to do damage to a man who, oh, come on um a man is is feared people are less likely to attack a man who is feared than a man who is only loved it, like if you can be both it's best but if you can yeah. only be one he says it's better to be feared because people won't attack you basically um i'm not sure if we completely agree with that but the idea being that sometimes being harsh is actually better than never being harsh yeah i think it's also um like we call this also tough love right if you give someone tough love meaning you're just being real with them for now um because they've been lying to themselves like comforting lies we all do right and sometimes you got to be harsh to them and openly state what you think, what they are doing with their life or what they're doing to you, for example. And um, of course, in this situation, it seems like, okay, I'm not being positive. This is all bad and these bad emotions lowering my vibe. But this is exactly what the New Age is doing. They are afraid of going down these, these lower scales, quote unquote, into these negative emotions. But then again, they are driven by fear, right? <laughs> I don't see how this is a good thing. Um, because the fear is driving them to not actually solve these issues with other people mm. or even with themselves. Well, fear is moving like them down, saying. right, as well. Sorry? Fear is also moving them down the scale. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Fear is one of the lower, scale, uh, lower on the scale, so it is actually moving them down if they don't face that. So I think, for me, also a spiritual part, I think the solution to life, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it like that, <laughs> I think the solution to life is neutrality meaning you are neutral to positive as well as negative things. Because if you are reactive, you are at the mercy of other people. And this doesn't mean you become an emotionally dead log who doesn't ever feel anything, right? But it is on your own peril what you do with that emotion, right? Or your own choice, I should say. For example, if I want to feel happiness because of something happened, then I do that. If I want to feel anger right now, then I do this. It's not what other people do to me. I'm neutral to what everyone else does. I don't care. It's, it's their thing. And I can decide, okay, they are having fun. Maybe I join that. Or my wife is having or is being sad for whatever reason. I join that and help her going through these emotions. But I'm neutral to it on a, on a higher scale, right? So I think this, is, this worked the best for me. And it also works in business in my eyes. Or what I have discovered, I should say, um, because I think being afraid of losing money is just as bad as loving money, as weird as it sounds, 
because then everything you do is always revolving around money when money is really just a tool. Hmm. It just is, right? If you think about rich people, they don't care about money that much. They care about their product. They care about creating impact, creating value. Money is just the, the product of that, right? Hmm. So if you want to make money, you've got to be neutral about it. You've got to not care about it, as weird as it sounds. This is the paradox. Most things you will discover later um, when you go down these things is most things in life are very paradoxical. <laughs> yeah. If you want something, you should not care about it. It goes and down to uh, like metaphysics and quantum physics. Yes, right? yeah. Yeah, metaphysics is a, is a deep rabbit hole. Um, but before you go down there, anyone listening, first solve, solve your physical issues, right? Um, money relationships and, and so on. And then you can actually go on to these things. But because you can lose yourself in that a whole lot. But it's also interesting if you, if you care about these things. Yeah. We'll see. The, uh... That's just one more thing because you mentioned my outgrowing John Peterson video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought for a long time if I actually published that video because I figured people might get it wrong. And considering how nobody liked that video so far, I guess they didn't get it right, <laughs> which is fine. I just want to get the message out. He is great, and he's been the great, greatest mentor for me for the longest time. I'm not saying he's bad at all. Mm -hmm. I just think what he teaches is, of course, for the, the first step, right? So pretty much for guys who are completely lost, he is the better alternative to Andrew Tate, in my opinion. Because he gets you going on a more positive way, like clean your room, right? These kind of things. The, the first basic steps. But at some point, this, in my opinion, just doesn't solve your issues anymore. On, on this on this lower level and you got to go a little bit deeper into things um, like for example metaphysics spirituality and pro the problem he has is that he is um, I say problem but this is of course any religion is written with dogma usually especially Christianity also so he's very intelligent he's super intelligent man so he is able to reconcile a lot of things with that but in many things I think he actually falls flat and this is where I think to start with, great guy, absolutely love, would, would love to talk to him at some point, right? Or shake his hand, great guy, because he did a lot for me. He pretty much, his self-offering suit was the thing that kickstarted my self-improvement pretty much. So great guy, but at some point, uh, I think you move ahead. And this is also why I said, I hope the guys watching me or listening to my stuff that they outgrow me at some point. I very much hope so. Otherwise I failed. <laughs> Yeah, outgrowing your guru, I think is the way you put it, which I think is a yeah. Yeah. a good yeah. concept. I think I have, if I think back to who I've watched over the years, I think I've done that as well. And I think it's good. It's like, it's funny how people go to these like productive routines, right? From, un yeah. from, from the, and then there's people like Alex or Mosey, if you're aware of him, who, um, talk about like the anti-routine and how like you shouldn't have a routine if you get the yeah. work done and you hit your goals it doesn't matter what the routine is if you said that to a beginner person who's been told to like take cold showers and meditate for yeah. this amount and go for a run every morning they'll just be like no 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 you shouldn't do that but it's like the levels you kind of need the foundations first before you then go to the next thing i believe Exactly. Actually, uh, a good friend of mine, he told me also when, when he saw that video about uh, John Peterson, he said, I should make a sort of self-improvement map where map are the gurus, who you start with and then where you ascend upwards. <laughs> but this is like, a, I don't know how big this project is because there's so many guys and girls out there doing this. Um, maybe I do that at some point. That would be cool. Um, I don't know if I'm the, the royalty to do this, but um, pretty much my own experience with that. But yeah exactly i think it would have to be your experience because i think there's different routes yes um yes. another example is like people start with like getting into money the, the the lowest level money stuff i guess is probably like just breaking bad beliefs around money like kind of rich yeah. dad poor dad that kind of stuff which is which is great yeah. don't get me wrong and then as I feel like you get more specific as you go up like if you're actually starting to scale a business you want really specific detail of like how do i solve this exact problem in the business not just generally how does money work right yeah there was one guy i think it was tesh Doza, i think who said it that um or maybe it was also alex Homozi, i don't know who said you make 10 million dollars way different than you do your first million mm. right 
a completely different thing. And you wouldn't think, why? It's just the thing that worked the first time, why would it not work later? And that's just a completely different mindset, completely different belief system, different tools and systems you use. So, and this is again, as you say, also the outgrowing in the money sphere, yeah, same thing. Yeah, I think this will be the, the last question. Uh, I, I've heard you talk about how you're, you still have like a job, right? Uh, and you have this yeah. self-conquering uh, brand business. Um, are you close to quitting? Because I heard you say you made 10K per month, uh, some months, so. Um, well, I just got a race there, so no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's actually not, well, I don't know how you phrase close, but um, no, I'm not quitting that soon, to put it that way. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, I went into the subconscious self-sabotage. I'm not making the 10 grand a month anymore. And this is also one thing. Um, I'm completely transparent and brutally honest about my, my business. I'm in the trenches with everyone out there trying to, to get out of the, the wage slavery. So um, I had the issue, quote unquote issue, that I made a big, or big mistakes with this house. I am currently recording this in or being on this call. Um, which I couldn't actually afford at the time. And now I'm sort of trying to get out of that. Um, getting that sold first, and then um, I'm thinking of, of quitting that. But I have the, the, the great opportunity of having enough leeway to work on my business on the side, although I actually will release very soon a video about how to, how to juggle all these balls with business, nine to five, wife, um, family, and kids, and all that. Um, because I've discovered myself, there are a bunch of traps you can fall into. And the big thing I want to give anyone listening to this who is also working still in 9 to 5 and is trying to, to get out of that by with his business, <clears throat> two things. The first thing is, if you still have money issues, you can't even make meets end, the business won't solve that. This is what I learned the hard way. Because it might just take 5 to 10 years until it actually does bring you enough money, right? So don't start a side hustle if you're not having enough money right now. That is a big mistake. This is usually a trap most people, most, most guys fall into. Um, because you might have three years of not making a zero dime or zero money before you actually get something. And then it happens in a year that you make 10 grand mm. a month, or 20 grand, whatever, even more. It can happen, right? But you first got to build. So this is the first thing I learned the hard way. And the other way, uh, the other thing is, it takes time, right? I think Naval Ravikant was it. I, I guess I butchered his name. Um, That's right. But he said, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said, um, everything worthwhile takes 10 years to build or something like that. Yes, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. And um, now this sounds like bad too, you have felt it before, but it's actually true. If, you, if you've been there, in there, if, in that yourself, you will notice at some point, okay, it's actually true. If you really want to create something, for example, you have 200 videos on YouTube, which have deep content and great content, right? Then this takes a bunch of years to make. If you think you do one video a week, that's just 50 videos in a year, right? So you, it takes you four years to just get to 200 videos. And people underestimate these, these numbers or never, never make these calculations. And then they try to put out more in a week, but the, the, the quality of the content suffers, right? So <laughs> um, this is where you have to realize if you want to have great content and you want to create a great sustainable, long-term sustainable business that yields for the rest of your life enough, enough money for you to, to escape actually that thing and not fall back into the, the wage slavery five years later, then you will have to, to go through five to 10 years potentially of not getting much money. You will get some money, of course, but not like the, the big thing to actually leave. And um, this is what you will have to, to go through. It's the adversity you will have to face. And so to answer your question with, with a very long story, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not quitting anytime soon. Not anytime soon. Um, I guess, I guess somewhat in the next three each years, I would guess could be possible. Um, but this is a, a rough guess. Uh, I cannot know. Maybe there is a recession coming. And maybe in that recession, they make a lot of money. Who knows, right? Um, for sure, but it's a, it's a rough guess. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah, this has been great. Um, I appreciate you doing this. Some uh, interesting thoughts from here. Where shall I send people? 
Well, my website, selfconquering.com, is the easiest one. Um, the main social media platform I use is YouTube. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, then check out my videos. Or I also have a free Telegram group. You will find the links on YouTube and everywhere to get sort of in direct chat contact with me. Um, but YouTube is pretty much uh, the main one. Or on my website, you find all the links. So selfconquering.com is, is, is the thing. Sure. We'll uh, drop those in the show notes. All right. Thanks, yes. Alex. Thank you very much for having me. It was, it was a great pleasure. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. All right. Have a good day. Yeah. Likewise. See ya.